My name is Lauren Anderson, and I'm the Manager of Alumni Relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for tonight's session, Sip with Jaywoo, Beverages for Your Holiday Table. We are excited to bring this program to you virtually, so together we can plan the perfect beverages for our holiday tables. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. With the exception of the presenters, all participants have been muted. Please leave your cameras off until the tasting portion of the presentation, and when directed, if you would like to turn your camera on, please do so. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. We will refer to this section to take questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Set your view to speaker view in the top right corner of your screen, and this will be the best way to see our presenter. We suggest selecting show small active speaker video as the view. Since we can't be together in person for this program, please keep it social. Feel free to share pictures of your at home setup, a selfie or photo of who you are enjoying this session with, and be sure to tag at JWU alumni in your posts on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Department Chair and Associate Professor Michael Sabatoni from the Providence campus. Michael Sabatoni is a proud JWU alum from the class of 1990 and earned him his MS in Hospitality Administration in 1990 too. He is the department chairperson for both the International Travel, Tourism Studies and the Food and Beverage Management Departments. Professor Sabatoni teaches many courses including beverage appreciation, food and beverage in the hospitality industry, front of the house operations management, orientation of the hospitality industry, and dynamics of tourism and sustainability. Prior to joining JWU, Sabatoni worked in both of these fields for nearly 30 years. He currently serves on the Educational Foundation Board of Directors for the Rhode Island Hospitality Association, and previously served on both the National Tourism Educational Advisory Council and as president and chairman of the board of the International Society of Travel and Tourism Educators, ISTTE. He was also on the board of directors for the Rhode Island Hospitality Association from 2009 to 2014. He is the recipient of the Visiting Scholar Award from the National Tour Association and the beneficiary of the prestigious Opperman Memorial Award for Lifetime Achievement from the ISTTE. We are so fortunate to have him with us this evening to lead this session. Please join me in welcoming Department Chair and Associate Professor Michael Sabatoni. Hi everyone, welcome to the Bigelow Beak Tea Lab here in Providence, Rhode Island, the Hospitality College of Management, Johnson Wales University. Very pleased to be with you today and talk to you about some of the things that we could possibly do to make our holidays a little bit more interesting. But let me tell you a little bit about this lab. In 2001, the summer of 2001, uh, we were very fortunate that the university um, gave us uh, permission to go ahead and got the entire wing here for those of you that possibly have visited or are actually taking classes here. Where I'm standing now used to be Professor Farrier, Donna Farrier's office, um, and Professor Pat Bowman. And down the corridor right there is the Salad Dining Room. What we did was we basically got at this and saw a trend in beverages that we needed to embrace in curriculum. So therefore, we were able to get the university to help sponsor uh, Beverage Lab, as well as the Bistro, which is actually next door to me. Uh, the Beverage Lab is actually a main course for the curriculum of Food and Beverage Industry Management. Uh, those of you that may have been in the past, maybe thought about restaurant um, food and beverage management, this was actually a course that was developed. So we're really focusing more on beverage. Uh, as I mentioned, we developed this in 2011, but just this past March, we're very, very fortunate to have Cindy Bigelow of Bigelow Tea uh, sponsor us, and she has been uh, named uh, the Bigelow Tea Lab, uh, excuse me, Beverage Lab. Cindy has graced us with several um, presentations here and tea tastings um, throughout the academic years prior to uh, COVID. Uh, so 
A couple of things we wanted to talk about today as we plan our gatherings, um, actually as we plan our meals, I should say, for the holidays or what beverages we're going to have on the holidays uh, as we move forward. And so a question that we often get asked is, how much should I spend on the beverages for the holidays? Well, first of all, you need to realize that drinks are just important. And when I say drinks, I mean beverages, all different beverages are just important as the meal. In fact, many times the beverages also can complement and will complement the meal. So you need to have plenty of drinks. And I'm not just referring to alcoholic drinks, I'm referring to all different types of drinks. A rule of thumb when planning for your meals is to have at least two drinks per person the first hour, for the first hour. And that's gonna take us into maybe possibly cocktails with appetizers or hors d'oeuvres and then moving into the meal. So once again, two drinks per person for the first hour. And then after that, you really want to have one drink uh, per hour. And once again, it doesn't necessarily have to be alcohol. It can be both non-alcoholic and alcohol being readily available. Of course, longer functions, uh, longer parties that you possibly may have in the future, uh, really we look at five drinks per person. And that's going to help us guide as we go through. So how do we actually save money? Well, the biggest expense for any type of gathering is really going to be the alcohol. But you don't have to go crazy, really. You don't have to load up on every single kind of alcohol that's out there. So what we want to actually do is tell you some ways that you can actually save money. And one thing that's actually cool is you can basically do a specialty cocktail um, for your particular function, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. Need to be creative. And really what you should do is think seasonality, some of the different types of um, ingredients during that particular season to help you with that specialty cocktail. Really. One way of saving money is by doing a batch cocktail, meaning a large bowl that you can actually then serve out of or have your guests serve themselves. This will definitely reduce the cost and make it much more fun um, when you're having a particular gathering. So I'm all about the fun. So let's have some fun. You should have actually had um, the uh, menus available to you. So we're gonna actually go ahead and we're going to start with our alcoholic drink. This way, once we get this done, you can sit back and just enjoy and then ask questions at the very end and zip on your cocktail. So today we're gonna to make a holiday drink and this is basically gonna be our apple cider margarita. And so what we need to do is we're going to actually, what I've done ahead of time is I put the sugar together, sprinkle some cinnamon sugar and on a flat plate. So what I actually did was I took some basic sugar and some cinnamon and I mixed it up just basically half and half. And then I sprinkled it out on a plate. It's important that I actually have it on the plate, spread it out nice and evenly. And then what I wanna do is, I wanna be able to take my margarita glass here, and I have prepared some wedged apples, some nice Macintosh apples. Macintosh apples are in season as you're all aware, this is season for Macintosh. So go ahead and take that apple and just rub it right around. Get those juices right out there on the rim of the apple, from the apple, put it right there. You can actually even see it once you run that right through. You want to get some nice juices there. And what we're going to do is give this a really nice rim for our cocktail. So I'm just going to put it in there, do a little twist, chubby checker twist. There we go. I'm picking it up and ah, very, very nice. It's coated all around the glass. So that's really nice. So now once again, we have the sugar mixture and the coat. Let's go ahead and start making our drinks. I'm gonna put this aside. I'm gonna add a little bit of ice to my shaker. Just a little. Because we're gonna actually have ice in the drink as well, as you know, with a margarita. So that's really one of the main ingredients. And so I'm going to take my Grand Marnier, and I'm going to do one, basically, ounce of Grand Marnier. So I hope you uh, have your ingredients all out and you're following along here so we can sip together. And then I'm going to take my gold tequila, salsa here. Um, folks, I really don't, when I make, um, cocktails uh, that are actually going to have fruits, etc. cetera. Um, I don't really use premium alcohol. Um, if I'm going to sip uh, tequila, which I've been known to do that, um, I will then go with the premium at that point. But at this point, we're gonna actually add all kinds of ingredients to it. So go ahead and pour that basically in. Um, and then what I really wanna do is, oh, put my apple cider. Oh, I get my apple cider here, hold on. So now, 
ounce was an ounce. So I had an ounce once again of the Grand Marnier. I had an ounce of the uh, gold tequila. And I'm actually going to do basically five to six ounces of the apple cider. So this is a um, local apple cider, all about sustainability. So this is the times, this is a one and a half. Cut this up because I can just see this all over the place. All right. All right. We're going to go ahead and shake that up. I want to really shake that up and so it gets to get cool while I actually take work, work on the cocktail glass next. So shake that up. And then I'm going to add some crushed ice. And, you know, don't go crazy if you don't have a refrigerator that doesn't produce the crushed ice. Just take your blender, throw your ice cubes in there, and um, just press it up. Go ahead and put the crushed ice right in the glass. Press this up a little bit right. Very, very nice. Okay. okay. Let's go ahead and pour that right over there. Right, nice. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. Oh, what's the fourth sabotage? Right on top. Okay, so now the garnish, right? So what we want to do is we want to take an apple slice, not a wedge, an apple slice, and we want to basically take that slice and put it right basically inside. Cocktail right on top of it. So, but once again, it wouldn't be a fall without a nice cinnamon stick, right? So let's go ahead and grab a cinnamon stick. Let's go ahead and put that in. Awesome. All right, ready? Hope we're ready to sip, and I want to hear the comments afterwards. Let's try this. Cheers. Mmm. Ah, that's very nice. Very, very nice. All right. But it's not only about the, once again, the alcoholic beverage. We also want to basically have a mocktail. And so with the same type of theme, basically being the fall, we want to go ahead and do a nice little special mocktail for our guests also. So let's go ahead and grab a glass. What we're going to do is actually call the Harvest Moon, as you can see on the slide. I got some really nice blackberries here, nice fresh blackberries picked up. I'll put four of them in the bottom of the glass. And for those of you that don't have a mold, basically you can just use the back of an ice cream scoop. It will actually work pretty well. I'm going to go ahead and pull that together really nicely right now. All right. This is pretty simple now. All I basically want to do is add my um, ice. I have to pull my glass here. And I'm going to basically put my grapefruit juice. I'm going to actually add my grapefruit juice. I'm going to go for two ounces. Let's go here. One. Two. And what's your side? Someone had asked me before, um, can I use ruby red? Sure. Sweeter. In there. And then um, you saw the recipe for uh, simple sugar. So once again, simple sugar is pretty easy to make. Once again, sugar and warm water. Um, I like to actually boil it. We're only going to actually use a half an ounce of this. Uh, so just going to put a half an ounce in. Pour that right in. Now, we're going to top it all off with some club soda. Pour that right in top. And then what I like to do too is before I go ahead and garnish it, I'm going to give it a little pour. So, of course, we can cut it soon. We're going to get that. Bottom come up top. Once I see it's floating, I know it's nice to see it's changed that color since I put that in there. Okay. 
And then I really want to garnish it with a half, and this is where we're going to get that moon from. And there we go. Cheers. This is the Harvest Moon Mocktail. Cheers, my friends. Mm. Very nice. Very refreshing, also. So, two nice signature drinks so we can have the party. I'm going to take this margarita with me and I'm going to just come around the front because we're going to move on and talk a little bit more about how to make our party a little more special. So, one thing that we want to be able to do with our beverages is to really pair with the food. And Thanksgiving is a really great opportunity with some really nice hearty food items that we're going to pair with. So, so a couple of things I want to share with you that we should keep in mind when we're pairing. I know some of you that are probably joining us are coming from maybe a food or culinary background. So this is going to be a little um, light for you, to be quite honest with you. But for those of you that really never thought about this, some things to really think about in when you're planning your meals um, or also any type of functions in the future. And this is really how we're going to pair beverages uh, with foods. I like to use the wine model when I explain this because people can actually comprehend a little bit more about the wine. But one thing you need to know is that we pair with all beverages. Um, in fact, today we're going to actually be talking about water and sparkling water. I'm going to talk to you about pairing foods with the waters and which waters should go well with different foods, especially this time of year. So pretty easy. If you see on the slide, we actually have um, in the bottom corner there, fairly reliable. And that's because of the wine that I'm maybe going to use will be very light and delicate. Two things we need to look at. We need to look at the body, which is the weight. And then we also need to look at the characteristics of the particular beverage as well as the characteristics of the food. So with the delicate wine, I wanna actually go with the delicate food item. Makes sense, correct? And so let's say hypothetically, I'm gonna do a Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc, I'm gonna say this is gonna be very light, maybe a light plus. I'm gonna have characteristics of citrus. So I really should pair this with a nice summer salad. And to bring in that citrus, I may be bringing some mandarin oranges that I'll actually put on there. Let's go to the far end of the spectrum, the bold side of things, and let's move up the scale. Let's look at the food item that's gonna be really rich and heavy. In this case, I'll make it very simplistic for you. We'll do a nice Kona rub filet mignon. That Kona rub is gonna give us some type of spicy notes to that filet, a little bit of earthy notes in that filet. And so it's gonna be very heavy. What I actually need to stand up to that filet is going to be something that's going to be of a heavy wine, but also with that heavy wine, I want to make sure I have some of those characteristics, such as possibly spices. I can also bring in some um, more like Bing cherry notes to that. And so in this case, I'll go for something like a Cabernet Sauvignon, very easy. So it's pretty easy when you're thinking about your items on your table that you're going to be planning. And even before your guests take the table uh, or sit down at the table for your meals to think about this. But one thing you need to take in consideration is also the cooking methods. Many of us are going to prepare chicken or uh, turkey different ways um, or our different types of side items that are going to be on the table. So when you're thinking about body, something to keep in mind is the way we actually produce uh, or cook our meals or our food items um, will actually have a profound outcome on basically the weight body. Of it. Give you an example, steam and poaching. Steam and poaching, basically more of the light, delicate, gentle side where we go more of the stewing and braising for the moist heat cooking methods, it's gonna be more full, bo full body, robust, intense. And so this is really what we wanna look at when we're planning. Um, case in point, if I was going to do some type of poached eggs, I wanna basically have maybe a, a light plus wine or beverage to accompany that. Whereas if I'm going to do a braised short rib, it may fall nicely off the bone, but that flavor is going to be intense and robust. And so I want something to actually stand up to that. Besides the moist heat cooking methods, many of you are familiar with coming off the summer seasons with the dry heat cooking methods. And so therefore, taking this into consideration, you know, I often laugh with students when we're trying to understand um, flavor profiling and matching foods and beverages. Uh, you just can't tell me a chicken or a piece of chicken. There are so many ways we can prepare that chicken. And as I stated, it's going to have a profound outcome on that flavor and also how we're going to pair it with a beverage. And so things such as uh, ways of um, dry heat cooking, such as sauteing, pan frying, deep frying. And when I say deep frying, I'm not referring to French fries and an oil or grease. I'm basically referring to something like tempura batter. That's gonna be nice and light and delicate. So I want something to pair nicely with the beverage that's gonna be light and delicate. As we move down the spectrum and we get to a little bit more medium body, planking. Uh, many of you probably have seen on a menu uh, cedar plank uh, salmon. And for those of you that don't know what it is, it's basically a cedar plank over the 
bit of flame um, with the salmon on top, which basically can be a meaty uh, a weight fish. And um, we may add something else to it, but what's gonna happen is that's gonna basically inherit the uh, roasty notes. It's gonna inherit the woody notes. And so with that medium body and those different types of characteristics that we're putting in that cedar, we wanna basically be able to carry that over to the beverage. Going down the spectrum, things such as grilling, barbecuing, and smoking, really gonna give us that full, robust, intense flavors. And so we want those full, robust, intense flavors in our beverages, uh, such as a barbecue chicken or barbecue short ribs, once again, uh, or barbecue ribs. Uh, really, once again, full body that we need to match that with. So a couple of terms that we're gonna actually think about because it's not always about the same, but what you have on your screen here is what we refer to as uh, characteristics that are in the food item need to be present in the beverage and that's complementing also known as bridge. And so when we look at some of the things that are gonna be on our table for the holiday season and the beverages that we're going to serve, think about are we going to be complementing it or are we just throwing things out there? And so once again, looking at this, we can actually take characteristics and the body from our food items and also pair them with the characteristics of the, um, the beverages. But besides complementary, we also or bridging, we also have basically contrast. And many times we are when pairing foods and beverages, we like to cut. And what I mean by that, I'll give you a perfect example. One of the teas that go well with a Thanksgiving meal that I'll mention in a moment is um, black tea. Black teas, because of the tannins actually associated, and a Thanksgiving feast is usually something of very heavy nature. And so therefore, black teas will go well with that. There are different black teas that we'll talk about. But if you use an Earl Grey, an Earl Grey is cut with bergamot, and bergamot being that Italian citrus. And so therefore, it's not going to be as strong, as robust as a traditional black tea normally is. And so we are cutting, we are complement, uh, we are contrasting. It's the same thing when we actually are trying to balance the acidity of a wine, as well as the sweetness or the residual sugar of that. We're looking for a balance. And so once again, the beverage may cut what actually is happening with the food item. So two things you can do when you look at your table and your food items and trying to figure out the beverages that will go best. You can either complement or you can contrast. Here's a little um, chart that I like to use now. Let's, let's look at it to see if you have an understanding. It's all about flavor profiling and when we talk about that profiling in the beverages. So quickly, I'll give you a, a nice uh, Chardonnay. Chardonnay is something that we can actually use during our Thanksgiving meal. And when we think about a Chardonnay, and this Chardonnay, I'll tell you, it is a, uh, I want to say it's a medium plus body, medium plus body in weight. Uh, it's not necessarily heavy, but definitely more than medium. And um, when I do a flavor profile and I pull out those characteristics on the palate, I'm getting some type of nuts. I'm getting pine nuts and macadamia nuts and almonds. But also when I put it on the palate and I not only do my, um, my, my body and my tongue, but I also, when I aerate it, I'm getting dairy notes. I'm getting cream and butter. I'm also getting vegetal notes, such as corn and potatoes. Well, I think I already described it for you. Chardonnay, a nice Chardonnay can go extremely well with mashed potatoes. That's actually gonna be on the plate or some type of cream soup. Some of us may start off with some type of cream soup for our um, uh, meal. And so therefore this Chardonnay would actually complement that. Riesling is another great white wine to use for our Thanksgiving feast. Uh, when we look at a Riesling, I'll go with this Riesling being a um, California Riesling. Um, and I say that because it can actually have a light plus to medium body, but also sweet. So this is gonna be a sweet Riesling. And when I think of those characteristics of that sweet Riesling, um, it could be raisins, pineapples, apricots, but also some type of honey. And so once again, thinking of the dishes that you may have at this time of year and bringing them over with a medium type of body that will actually pair nicely with that reason. Another great match is also on your slide here for this type of um, Thanksgiving dinner and that's Pinot Noir. Um, Pinot Noir, uh, basically can be a medium type of body Pinot Noir. And one of the times, many times we're gonna get some type of spiciness in that Pinot Noir. And so we get the vegetal taste, such as possibly mushrooms or even shallots, but we're gonna get those vegetal notes, um, as well as onions and bell pepper. And then a little bit more of the um, potatoes possibly coming out in some, depending on the terroir, if we're doing an old world Pinot Noir versus a new world Pinot Noir. And so when you think about that, that's really, 
comes up with matches nicely with ripened fruit, such as cranberry. And one of the staples this time of year that's going to be many on many people's uh, tables is going to be cranberry sauce. Um, I often say a Pinot Noir goes extremely well with a Thanksgiving sandwich the next day. Nothing but sitting back and having a nice Pinot Noir while I have a nice sliced turkey, uh, some bread with uh, some stuffing and um, some cranberry sauce. So that gives you a little idea where I'm going with this as we try to pair the foods with the beverages. Not necessarily record science, and once again, it is subjective thinking about what you are. However, let's talk about the different types of beverages that we will have. Um, so we actually pair with all beverages, as I mentioned before, and water is not is, is, is also very viable when we think about water. Uh, when you think about the waters that are out there, we actually put them in different types of categories, bold, classic, um, light, effervescence, as well as still. And I often think about the different courses that will complement with different waters. And so when I look at possibly appetizers or cocktails, you want something lively, you want some lively bubbles. So I'm referring to sparkling wines and really you want the, the large, medium-sized type of bubbles that will go well. And this is what I mean by lively. Um, you know, keep in mind, different brands are going to have different signature uh, differences when you look at the brands, so, such as on my screen, I have the uh, San Pellegrino. Um, but those can be very, very minerality, can have some nice minerals in it that's going to actually stand up to it. It can be very, when it's served cold, extremely cold, it can be very bold. And not many people may not like it because it could be overwhelming to them. So if you like San Pellegrino, but it can be too bold for you, don't serve it so cold. Serve it basically at room temperature. That's kind of tame or less lively the bugs be a bubble. So that's really what it's all about. When we're thinking about dinner and what to serve with dinner as far as water, you're looking at more of the higher mineral content. So as you select your bottles of water, think about that higher mineral content um, for those robust foods. And I'm referring to what's gonna be on that Thanksgiving table, that turkey, that gravy, that stuffing. Those are robust foods. And so you really want to have the high mineral content, but here the category is the effervescence type of waters that you want. And when we talk about that, they're gonna have smaller bubbles. They're really not gonna be those medium large bubbles that really will stand out and be much more lively. It's gonna be a little more con um, calming, but because they're going to be of high mineral content, they're gonna stand up to those robust foods. When we move into the dessert category, um, once again, looking at effervescence as well as still water pairs nicely with desserts. Uh, one of the uh, all-time best pairings is a nice um, pumpkin pie with some type of still water, um, still mineral water, bringing in you a little bit of the um, 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 earthy tones to it, the minerality, but also complementing the pumpkin pie. Let's move on to teas and coffee. So, so when we talk about teas and coffee, as I mentioned earlier, um, it really wants to think about the seasonality. And so as you see on our screen, of course, I have our good friends, Bigelow. Um, and the reason why I share these with you is because really you want some of those same characteristics to complement that you will find on your dinner table. And so going to dinner and having tea throughout your meal, um, you really want to focus on possibly the black teas. Uh, the black teas go extremely well with turkey dinners. Uh, one in case is Ceylon. Ceylon basically being a Sri Lanka type of tea. It's going to be more bold. It's going to have medium tannins, um, but it's also going to have some spice and some lemon notes with that. So once again, you can see how it's going to complement some of the items when we actually put some cinnamon in our um, up, um, uh, spiced potatoes or our, um, oh my God, escapes me from it. But um, any type of the uh, spices that we may use in our meals there. Um, another tea that if you don't want as bold as uh, the uh, Ceylon is the Darjeeling. Darjeeling basically is less brisk, uh, but it is still complex. Um, it has some notes of grapes usually, but also stone fruit, which is really a nice complement to many things that will be on your item on your table. Um, for this time of year. And then lastly, one of the uh, teas that go extremely well is oolong tea. Uh, many people don't really you know, go out and purchase as much oolong tea here in the United States. But when you think about it, most of us probably have had oolong tea. In fact, I can guarantee that 80% of you that are joining us today have had oolong tea. Where have you had oolong tea? Probably at a Chinese American restaurant. And when you think of the characteristics of oolong tea, usually smooth, usually rich, 
um, fruity to even sweet. These are all the characteristics of a standardized long tea, not talking about an infused, but a long tea. Um, they go well with that diverse Chinese American restaurant um, menu. Um, so from sweet and sour to hot and spicy, et cetera. So once again, when you look at teas and coffees that you will plan, it's not just about desserts. Some people will actually consume tea and coffee throughout the meal. Um, and then what you wanna do is look at those characteristics that are seasonal, um, such as maybe a pumpkin spice coffee that will bring in some type of spices in your meal. Let's move to craft beers. Uh, so once again, following the same trend that I'm actually saying, uh, when we look at some of the different types of beers that are uh, very popular this time of year, you're going to see many of those spicy types of beers, the Oktoberfest, pumpkin beers, uh, the smashed pumpkin, etc. But another beer that I don't have on the slide that I want you to really think about is uh, Saison. And uh, when you think about Saison, basically just a little information originated in uh, southern Belgium. Uh, when you look at this, it, you really want to look at the autumn type of seasonal Saisons. And really what you're going to find in those beers that will pair nicely with many of your food items on the table, it's going to be rich. It's going to be full of spices. Um, it's actually many times with uh, Saisons, uh, a late um, season foods that they are actually going to be um, um, brewing with. So it really kind of pulls together, once again, those characteristics. And I know I'm leaning towards heavily towards more of the complementing of the foods. Uh, moral of the story here as we go through with beers is to uh, think about the uh, characteristics. And you'll find many more characteristics uh, that will match nicely in craft beers and ales that you actually will find in lagers. Ah, but wine. Oh boy, we can do so much with wines. When we think about wines and what we actually need to pair. Um, I already mentioned to you about the Chardonnay with the mashed potatoes or the, uh, the Pinot Noir uh, with the turkey. And, but there's a couple of other ones. Um, Chenin Blanc is a really nice wine for Thanksgiving. And the reason why it's nice, it has delicate fruits that actually complements both light and dark meat. So when you're looking for a nice um, uh, wine, uh, the uh, Chenin Blanc um, is very nice and it's really one of the more popular wines that's actually served with turkey. Um, I mentioned the Chardonnay because once again, the creamy and buttery notes that we normally will find in, in Chardonnay. Um, some of you may have an oak cast Chardonnay that's gonna bring in more of the earthy tones or the wood tones. Um, the Pinot Noir I mentioned, but also in the red area, besides the Merlot I have on your screen, um, think about the Zinfandel. The Zinfandel is actually going to be more of a big, full body type of wine that will stand up to heavy foods. And let's face it, there's one meal that I know is going to have a lot of heavy foods at it. It's going to be this time of year, um, especially at that Thanksgiving table. So it will stand up to those sweet potatoes. That's what I was trying to think about before with the cinnamon, the sweet potatoes. Um, stands up nicely to those sweet potatoes. Um, and that's a really nice, heavy type of wine. Um, when you think of dessert in this particular area as we go through, really what will complement those spices in the pumpkin pie would be a nice port. And um, those characteristics of that port, and I'm referring to more of a tawny port, an aged tawny port that's gonna be more mellow and brown, but still gonna be sweet. When we think of the characteristics of how we pair desserts with beverages, we really wanna have the beverage sweet or sweeter. So once again, the beverage needs to be sweet or sweeter in order to pair well um, with that dessert. And in this case, a pumpkin pie and a nice tawny pork will actually pair a nice, little bit better than more of a ruby pork that can be very fruit forward um, and very, very sweet. Let's face it, um, spirits. Spirits are not just for the end of the meal. You can actually, this time of year, because of this time of year and what spirits actually has to offer for us, uh, can actually follow through the entire meal. Uh, whiskey is a fantastic pairing throughout the turkey dinner. Full flavored bourbons also are very, very good throughout the meal. And then when we think about scotch, we really want possibly have a single malted scotch because you really don't want to have um, something that's going to be uh, so much peaty at this particular point. A good example, and not that I like to endorse any one particular brand, that's why I'm kind of like all over the place with the brands that you see, uh, Glen Levitt is a good single malt scotch uh, that can actually enhance your Thanksgiving meal as you throughout. And um, keep in mind, we can actually use this in possibly a specialty cocktail in the beginning of our meal. So 
really when we look at the beverages, we really want to talk about all different types of beverages and think about how we can actually plan ahead at our Thanksgiving table and think about what we can actually serve, thinking about those batch cocktails that we may serve when someone actually arrives, thinking about possibly the water instead of just having tap water and how it can enhance the meal, possibly bringing in tea or coffee throughout the entire meal, but also at the end of the meal. Um, one thing that you really need to understand um, as we go through the meal, as the food costs increase um, intensity, so do the beverages. And with that stated, we understand that Thanksgiving meal, sometimes it's more family style. We may have a soup course served to us first. Or prior to that, we may have an appetizer while we're actually socializing or sitting around the table just talking before the meal comes out and maybe starts with possibly a soup. But as we actually start to increase and give us that full, um, more robust uh, meal items, we need to think about those beverages. And so therefore, along besides the tea and coffee, think about the beer that you possibly would serve that will complement your meal. Think about the wines and think about the foods that you'll have on your table. Many of us will have some of the common foods, such as those sweet potatoes or the mashed potatoes or candy yams uh, that could be very sweet. Definitely possibly having turkey. All, some will have some ham. Um, and once again, pairing with those particular robust types of meals. Um, one thing I often think about when we said that recently, which is a really good pairing, um, not only for a Thanksgiving meal, but it's also an excellent pairing with ham. Many times we actually will do some type of pineapples with the ham. And if you recall my slide earlier that gave us the um, uh, flavor profile, I had honey in there. And so with that honey, we can actually carry that over. So with that, I'm gonna actually go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I'm gonna turn it over back to Lauren for a moment so we can answer any uh, questions. And I'm going to uh, take another sip while I'm waiting to see those chat questions come through of my um, specialty cocktail margarita. Cheers, thank you. That's such great information. And especially with such a diverse um, array of foods on the table, um, it's great to hear different things that go with different um, parts of the meal. So we do have a couple questions um, from the chat and I just wanted to um, say, is there a seasonal cordial that I should have on hand for Thanksgiving or any staple cordial to have as well? Yeah, I'm sorry, can you just repeat that one more time? Yep, so a seasonal cordial or a staple cordial to have on hand for Thanksgiving. So I would have a seasonal cordial at this time of year. Keep in mind, once again, I mean, in, unless you know your guests, but it's this is a time of year that you're on something special. And sometimes when I actually have entertained at my house, I often like to bring um, something that I create and that when people arrive, they're like, wow, I never even thought of that. This is something nice. And I, I usually from year to year, I had the same guests come back and they'll say, hey, you mixed it up. What about that last year? I just happened to have the, the ingredients. But it's a good time for people to try something new. Um, and so I always like to go with something seasonal, something different, um, but keep also in the background of some things that people do enjoy. Yeah. Um, so Kiana is asking, in regards to the drinks that were made, could you add the gold tequila to the mocktail or would you go with a different spirit? For the mocktail, would I add a gold tequila? So if I was going to do that, I would definitely add the gold tequila because keeping, um, once again, uh, with those combo notes, those um, dark mocha notes more for the fall season. Okay, great. Um, what are some drinks that we can have on hand for the entire holiday season? For the entire holiday season. So when you, when you say drinks on hand for all holidays? Yeah, I would say like November to January. Okay, so once again, you know, you think about some of the things that I repeated that are great. Um, you know, a Chardonnay, you can't go wrong by having a Chardonnay in the house. Um, Chardonnay goes really well with a lot of different things, especially in the this time of year for the holiday season. Um, once again, things are going to be a little bit more heavier in nature. Um, and so therefore you want to have that type of cream, uh, et cetera. Um, but you also have to be cognizant of individuals that like things that are light. So um, when you think about that, one thing I would like you to really look at is that um, um, Chardon Blanc um, is a very nice wine that people don't really explore as much as they should. People that are, uh, have an understanding of wine will actually go with that. And that's something that's really nice because it's, um, it's delicate food. And I, and I like that because it's delicate food, but yet it can stand up to something that's robust. In the red category, I got to be honest with you, you can't go wrong with having a Merlot on hand. Um, you know, once again, I'm a Cabernet Sauvignon drinker and I'm also a uh, Sangiovese drinker. Um, but 
when it comes to Merlot, I can actually have multiple different types of uh, meals with my Merlot. Uh, the Pinot Noir also, if it's a, a medium body Pinot Noir, I tend to like more old world Pinot Noirs and not to talk uh, terminology here, when we mention old world Pinot Noirs, we're mainly referring to Europe, uh, European. Um, so they tend to, for me, tend to be a little bit more minerality from the terroir. And so therefore um, I like that, but uh, if you think about the wine area, go with the Merlots. Now, when you're thinking about beers, once again, you know, what's the explosion right now and a lot of the trends that we're actually seeing is, uh, is craft beers and they're brewing with everything. I have a, a good friend that's a brewmaster um, up in um, Syracuse. And um, last time I went to visit him, he was actually brewing with spruce this time of year. And so when you think about that, how nice that actually is, not only for this fall, but moving into the winter. So I'm one that always likes the seasonality. That's one thing I would actually stress And when you're looking for the beers or the uh, beverages you're gonna have on hand. Um, and then once again, teas. Um, I am a green tea drinker and yet I didn't mention anything about green teas because really when you think about this type of meal and this type of time of year, you really want something that's gonna be a little bit more robust. Um, oolong teas are known to be um, light to medium body and black teas are known to be medium to heavy bodies. And that's probably that's where you want to stay at this particular juncture. Um, that's not to say that you can't get a green tea, like a, a matcha green tea, um, uh, that's going to be a little bit more heavier um, and a little more pungent. Uh, it's actually almost a uh, quiet taste. I'm not talking about the uh, tea or uh, matcha uh, cocktails or drinks that you get at a Starbucks. I'm referring to having a matcha tea straight. You'll see, once again, it's a little bit more quiet taste, something I actually get every morning. So I think that answers your question. I'm always more of the seasonality type of things, but um, looking at those staples, more of that Merlot, those Chardonnays, um, a good craft beer uh, that we will have. Uh, really, if you haven't had uh, that Saison, uh, you should really try that. I think people will be really making a, a lot of headway here in the United States, becoming more and more popular. See it really trend. Great. Um, so Vera would like to know, have you ever used vinegar shrubs for cocktails and any advice on that? So Vera, no. And Vera, nice to see, nice to hear that you're here. Thank you. Um, I have to be quite honest with you. I have not. So we will need to follow up on that um, vinegar shrub. And, uh, and I know that you're in a nice world there with all your different um, oils that you actually have to offer. And I'm sure you are um, exposed to many different types of um, um, uh, spices and et cetera, things to go and work with those oils. So no, but I like to follow up with that. That one I can't answer for. <laughs> um, another question, you may have touched on this, but if there is only one wine for the whole meal, what do you recommend? So if there's only one wine for the meal, I would actually go with the Pinot Noir. Um, and the reason why I would do that Pinot Noir is um, because I, I feel that it's a, for this meal, for the Thanksgiving meal, it has many of the characteristics of um, many things that would be actually on the table. Um, and uh, you're not going too bold or too heavy and then you're not going too light, but yet it's also going to pair nicely with many of the um, um, traditional dishes. Um, and actually Pinot Noir goes well with um, chocolate too, if you're going to be serving some type of dessert with chocolate. Great. Um, any recommendations on hot cocktails for the holiday season? Oh uh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> Um, so one thing that I, I did not bring up, um, and, uh, and especially this time of year, and as we're getting um, colder, um, took my winter coat out today, uh, I didn't bring anything about with hot chocolate. And, um, and that's a good one. You can actually just do a hot chocolate, uh, and you can spice it up, or you can actually do a hot chocolate with some type of uh, a liqueur. With it. And um, I often really enjoy doing um, hot chocolates with like very flavorful um, liqueurs. Uh, like a banana liqueur and a hot chocolate. Uh, think about some of the things that you may see in a, um, um, a specialty food store that they dip bananas in hot chocolates or strawberries in hot chocolate. Well, think about having that type of infused alcohol uh, that you can actually add to that hot chocolate. Um, one thing that I'm also, um, I enjoy this type of year and I also like to promote is um, the Irish creams um, and what you can actually do with Irish cream and, and add those to different types of cocktails. Uh, to make it a little more thick um, and add a little more add amaretto as well as Irish cream um, and then put some types of spices in it to make it a specialty drink. Great um, and kind of following up on that any advice or recommendation on mulled wines or mulled beverages? Yeah so um, you know those have really become those are extremely popular this time of year and uh, 
you know, and, and people, when I find with mulled wines is that they actually create their own by adding different types of um, um, spices and, and different types of, um, uh, I don't wanna say plant matter, but floral essence into it. Um, so no particular one that I wanna go into in particular area, I could just see uh, basically taking a nice mulled wine and heating it up and then adding some type of um, seasonality seasons to it. Uh, to make it nice um, and to bring in. Once again, I'm trying to think of what's on the table that you would bring in. So if you're using a lot of cinnamon, are you using vanilla, pecan? Once again, that's some of the things that you possibly want to add to that. Great. Um, is there a reason that or why, or why do we tend to drink darker beers and wine in the cooler or winter months? Why do you uh, why do you drink heavy uh, darker beers in the and wines in the cooler months? Yep. Okay. Um, once again, when you think about those darker beers, they're going to be more, well, and I say with body, because, you know, I, I got to be honest with you, when I look at a, a porter, many times a porter, when I look at the body, it's not as heavy, but as the taste. Is. And so once again, it's really when you think about the heaviness um, in the winter months and more heavy foods that we actually will have. Uh, think about what you consume in the summer um, as far as foods. We're looking at many different types of salads, et cetera. But sometimes our, our diets change when it gets to the winter and some of the heavier foods that we actually will be having. So we tend to more uh, lean towards the heavier types of beverages um, and, and, you know, from spirits. I mean, I gotta be quite honest with you. I, I normally drink more bourbon and more whiskey and scotch over the winter months. Um, and usually at the end of the meal, um, because once again, progressively, I don't want to, and we'll be able to go back, uh, than I do in the summertime. Um, I drink more of the lighter types of beverages in summer. And it's just because of the, the different types of foods I have. Um, and also one, one would actually say the comfort of it. Great. Um, we have a, I think that's it for right now. We have a, a couple more minutes. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, my question I just thought of offhand is about um, making your own syrups. Like you, you talked about the, the spruce and how can you elevate like even a mocktail with a seasonal flavor um, in a simple syrup or any addition in that way? Okay, so, um, so taking a traditional mocktail and making it a little bit, uh, adding a little bit more ingredients. I mean, today we, we try to do things that you would be able to um, just grab easily and make it at home. Um, and, you know, let's face it, when we go to some of these craft um, um, bars nowadays, uh, craft cocktails are in and they're using all different types of simple syrups um, and infusing them with all different types of ingredients, which is fantastic. And so, you know, what you really enjoy and taking that simple syrup and then adding um, some of the ingredients to it that, that you may think that is, uh, is, is special, like um, to give you, a, you know, I'm right now I'm focused on the fall season and fall um, menus as well as moving into the holiday season. Um, but peppermint, is gonna be really infused in many of the beverages as I move forward, I'm making that transition out of November and into December. And peppermint's a nice way to actually add to a simple sugar um, that you can actually use. Great. Um, is there any place for Beaujolais Nouveau with the turkey dinner? Of course, yeah. Well, keep in mind with Beaujolais um, Nouveau, you're gonna have a little bit more fruit, fruitiness in that. Um, and so it's, it's not, when you look at, I, was, I don't really want to push fruit forward wines um, during the holiday meal, this holiday, this particular holiday meal. Um, however, um, you can have that as, as a pre-meal and depending on what type of appetizers you may serve. Uh, we don't see at the Thanksgiving table, a lot of, um, we, we do see grapes and we always think about the cornucopia and we'll have some those fall types of fruits. Um, but when we get to those, uh, those uh, more of those lighter fruits, um, they really don't complement as well. So, but if that's your preference and that's what you like, by then all means, then you'll go ahead and drink it and have a good time. Absolutely. Um, so another question is about the mentioning of port for dessert pairings. Do you yes. have any recommendations for port or and the dessert accompaniments? Uh, so I, my recommendation for a port is a nice spicy pumpkin pie. Um, if you're looking for a brand, I, I, I try not to uh, um, quote any particular brands, but there's some really nice ports out there. Um, and uh, really, when you're looking at the port, you know, you can get an aged port um, that can be a little bit more mellow, or you can have a very fruity port with port. One thing I, I should have also stated early on, um, don't be afraid to ask the professionals. Don't be afraid to walk in 
to um, your package store or your liquor store and, um, and say to them, you know, I'm interested in having a pork. Um, these are the things I'm thinking of having for dessert. I'm thinking of having pecan pie. I'm thinking of having pumpkin pie. Um, can you tell me which pork or brand of pork um, that will actually complement that? And I, I guarantee you, in some of these major stores, this is what we're really looking at here at the university. We have embraced this um, in educating our students to go into this field. In fact, I'm very proud as I sit here today, uh, working last night until 6.30, we were able to get the new uh, beverage sales and marketing management degree um, approved, which is basically a uh, combination of three colleges, the College of Business, CFIT, um, Culinary um, Food Innovation and Technology, and the Hospitality College. And that degree, when you look at it, really lends to the trends that we're seeing as far as students getting involved in those areas of hotel, uh, retail sales, um, also host, uh, wholesales, um, brand ambassadors, and knowing those beverages. So one thing I, I apologize for not saying earlier, but you know, um, take what we're saying here today, but also don't be afraid to ask your professionals um, in, the, uh, in the stores. Just don't think that sometimes they're just clerks, many of them are extremely, extremely knowledgeable with a lot of talents. Um, so we have a, a request for your personal favorite port wine. What is the, what's the brand of your favorite? Mm -hmm. Um, so I will have to say, my wife is the port drinker, all right, so um, I'm going to have to go with, uh, you know, I have to say she's more of the port drinker, I'm going to have to go, uh, you know, well, or what's what's your wife's favorite? I mean, I'm trying to think what I just bought her that she really enjoyed. Wait, 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 You know what? I'm gonna to have to give you. I'll send that to you in an email. Um, <laughs> that one I just got. I, I can't remember the like the bottle for. Um, I don't normally drink pork. I am more of at the end of my meal while she's having her pork. I'm more going to have that that whiskey or even that to be quite honest with you, the uh, scotch. You're good, wonderful. Um, so we had another question about warm cocktails. Warm um, cocktails. Warm cocktails. Is there any other alcohols that you can drink warm? Oh yeah. So yeah, by all means. I mean, when you. Uh, so when we talked about warm cocktails, um, we really didn't get into all different types of uh, cocktails you drink warm, but um, I would actually look at, you know, when you think of um, some of the trends that are taking place with warm cocktails, um, you know, your, your bourbons are gonna be warm, your whiskeys are gonna be warm. Um, you can even, um, you know, and that's where it's gonna be bringing out those flavors. Many times we actually eat uh, those. So those are really good um, craft cocktails that you can infuse warm. I mean, you're not going to do um, any type of vodka drink warm. You're really not gonna, you're gonna stay away from tequila drink. Um, you're really gonna go more with the grain spirits that are gonna be warm. Uh, uh, although there are the fruit spirits that people actually enjoy. Um, but uh, when it gets to the vegetable spirits, uh, your, your rums, your vodkas, as well as your tequila, um, those are not really meant for warm. So I would stick more with grain spirits and I would stick with fruit spirits uh, to, to Great. A um, couple more questions. So other than the apple cider margarita, what would you recommend for a seasonal batch cocktail? Um, okay. <laughs> or any recommendations on creating your own? So um, what, I, what I'm thinking of for the, uh, the, this is my cocktail for this season right now. Going into Christmas, I'm going to take that nice little vodka and I'm going to infuse it um, with some um, peppermint vodka. Um, and I am going to make a candy cane, um, mostly batch drink, um, like almost like a martini. Um, and I can, um, I'm going to actually do, uh, uh, the, um, uh, crushed, uh, candy canes around the rim, um, that I'm going to put it in and, um, top it off with the candy cane inside. So that's really what I'm looking at. It's going to be a little bit more sweet than I normally go. Um, but I am a vodka drinker. Um, I know people are sometimes surprised when I say that, um, but uh, I do vodka. For me, the vodka is all about the, how many times it's been distilled and looking for that, that, that pure vodka that I go after. So to me, that's what I'm focusing on for um, my pre-meal. Um, I always have wine with my meals and then I like to end my meals possibly with a nice uh, type of green spirit or, or cognac. Great. 
So our last question comes from Pia and she's asking, do dark rum cocktails go with any part of the Thanksgiving meal? Yeah, dark rum for sure. So just like I use the gold one, keep in mind, dark rum also is um, going to be full flavored. It's going to have you more of the characteristics of, you know, you think about a, um, a dark rum versus like a, a Maya's nice spice rum. Think about how nice that can go with anything um, um, with on the Thanksgiving table. So by all means, you can actually, when you think about the spice rum, um, that you can actually make a nice cocktail or a specialty cocktail out of dark rum um, and by adding different types of ingredients. But I would think, I would ask that you uh, tell you that you should do four ingredients um, to spruce it all up. Um, much very similar to what we did here. I mean, there's nothing that you can, you know, when you think about that dark rum, um, you can take some sugar and um, you can actually mix it in with some type of cinnamon or, um, or a more um, potent fall spice. Great. Well, thank you, Professor Zabatoni. And now I'd like to turn it over to Lori Zabata, Director of Alumni Relations, to close us out. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Sabatoni, for such an informative discussion and our delicious signature cocktail recipes. You certainly have prepared us for the upcoming holidays. Your knowledge and beverages is beneficial for us all, and your delivery makes learning enjoyable, comfortable, and entertaining. We're grateful to you for sharing your time with us and appreciate all that you've offered in this session. Thank you. I'd like to also thank the alumni relations team for their help behind the scenes, especially Lauren Anderson for her work to bring this program to us. I'd finally like to thank all of our alumni attendees for joining us for this seasonal celebration. Our students learn similar content to help prepare them to enter the hospitality industry and provide exceptional service to their own guests. You can help support tomorrow's hospitality leaders today with a donation to the College of Hospitality Management, but your gift is more than a donation. The simple act of giving any amount actually contributes to the growth of JWU's reputation, our rankings and ratings. Alumni giving is a key metric in US News and World Reports annual rankings. You can boost JWU standing by giving each and every year to the university, which increases the value of your degree and makes alumni even more sought after by employers. But most importantly, when we all contribute what we can, we combine our efforts to make a real difference for the students following in our footsteps. That is the power of collective giving. So if you're in a position to give, I ask that you consider doing so. As an added bonus, all gifts made from now until December 31st will be matched dollar for dollar. We've included a link in the chat for your convenience. On behalf of our students, I thank you for your generosity. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed this evening session, Sip with JWU Beverages for your holiday table, part of the JWU for You family of programming. Through JWU for You, alumni can engage in informative and interesting discussions related to professional development, social and avid interest topics. Join us on December 16th when we will pop the bubbly and learn more about sparkling wine from our inaugural Sip with JWU presenter, Associate Professor Mark DiMarchena. We'll be preparing for the new year and as always, there will be a tasting component. For more details and the full listing of upcoming events, please visit our events calendar at alumni.jwu.edu. We appreciate your attendance and wish you a wonderful night. Thank you so much for coming.